Good morning. I'd like to start today out and close the day with two brief meditation practices. So if you would, find a comfortable position. And keep your eyes open. Take three good breaths with me. So we entered our sacred space of creativity and silence today. And we've been in a community without words. We asked on your name tags and on the board, if you would ask your own self the question, what is silence to you? And we got a lot of interesting answers. Everything from silence is scary to me, silence is hard to find, silence is my refuge, Silence makes me productive AF, and the list went on. Let's just spend a little time thinking about our community and where we each are individually and together in silence. It was a great May day. I mean a really great day in May. The sky was blue. The sun was shining. The temperature was in the low 70s. A gentle breeze was blowing. The perfect day. The reason we live in these beautiful mountains. My friend Chris and I had just arrived at the retreat center in Madison County. A really nice rustic lodge tucked into the forest. We were there for a retreat called The Marriage of Meditation and Yoga. Built on the premise that meditation and yoga are actually really quite interconnected. In the West, unfortunately, we've sort of separated them into a couple of practices. Now, I had had a yoga practice for some time, but I was pretty new to meditation. And frankly, I was a bit anxious about this retreat. When I went through the schedule, I came to realize that there would be um, six seated and three walking meditations each day, an hour apiece, with five hours of yoga interspersed in between. <laughs> this was a pretty advanced practice for me. But there was one element of this retreat that really gave me angst. It was a silent retreat for six days. I'm an extrovert. I am a talker. I'm a teacher. The foundation of my life is the spoken word. How on earth was I going to keep quiet for six days? And to boot, there was no watching television, videos, listening to music, writing, writing in your journal, anything at all. Nothing to provide distraction, everything focused on the task at hand. Complete and total silence, even within ourselves. Now, about an hour after we arrived, we got settled in, and then we went to the meditation hall, got in a circle. The instructors welcomed us, told us a little bit about the philosophy of the retreat, and then gave us a little instruction and we started with our first meditation. It wasn't until later in the evening that I realized we'd never introduced ourselves. I had no idea who the 23 other people I was spending a week with were. I didn't know their name. I didn't know where they were from. I didn't know what they did for a living. I'd come to realize by the end of the week that was not by happenstance on our instructor's part. Because I know anybody's name, I just started making them up. 
humans sort of have a fundamental need for taxonomy and labeling. So there was one of my roommates, old Tom. He was an IT guy from Atlanta. He wasn't really old, but he was old Tom. And then there was um, Big Bill. He was a bluegrass bass player. <laughs> Margaret, she was a homemaker from the Midwest. There was the professor. And of course, Mary Ann. <laughs> and Granny. And yes, that Granny. There was a woman who looked a great deal like Irene Ryan, uh, the actress who played Granny Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> But the truth was, I didn't know any of their names, and I didn't know any of their stories. I was just making it up. So at first, the whole thing was sort of cute. We would give each other the eye and signals and wink at each other and hold the door open for each other in some kind of effort to communicate. <coughs> the first couple of meditation practices that afternoon, that afternoon went really well. I have to admit, I was not that used to sitting on a Zafu for that long, so my lower back was hurting me just a little bit. Our first awkward moment came a little later on, at 6 p.m., dinner time. So we went into the dining hall, went into the kitchen, filled our plates, sat down at the table, had our first bite, swallowed, looked at the person right across the table from us, and got ready to say, oh, yeah absolutely nothing. So we just sort of smiled and stared each other for a little bit, and then we let our eyes wander to go between the two people, because it was a little strange eating, looking, and not talking. I'll be honest, it was really super weird. Uh, that was the only time I have ever been in community with people at a meal and not spoken. I mean, that's a pretty fundamental cultural norm for us. And so we, we found it pretty awkward. Um, in fact, once dessert time came, we got our dessert and we didn't go back to the table. We went outside, sat in the rocking chairs, went over to the couches, anything not to have to awkwardly stare at each other. <coughs> now, we'd find some sort of balance with this by the end of the week. But I'll be honest, this still remained one of the most awkward times uh, throughout the entire retreat. Now, as the days passed, I was doing really well with the yoga. We had a great instructor. I was doing new stuff, and she was pushing us to the edge, and I like to be pushed in yoga. But to be honest, I was struggling with the meditation. Um, this was no hardcore, you know, lockstep Zen practice or anything. Uh, but nonetheless, my back was hurting, and, and frankly, as each meditation passed, I was just getting a, a little more frustrated with each time. Um, my anxiety was increasing a little bit, uh, to the point that by Thursday afternoon, I was a bit frustrated. That's not true at all. I was ticked off. I was angry. I was really frustrated that I was there. Um, I am not an angry person, but I was as angry as, frankly, I had ever been. To the point, I went and got my keys, sat in my car, and contemplated, how awkward will it be if I leave the retreat knowing that I have to come back and pick my best friend up? <laughs> then I remembered that Jeff, one of our instructors, said, well, this is your retreat. Make it your own. By God, I will make it my own. I'm not going to go to the next meditation or maybe the next. I don't know when I'm going back in that meditation hall. We have beautiful woods. I'm going out in the woods. And I spent the next two hours walking through the woods, and I didn't realize then, but I came to realize and know now, those were two of the most important hours of my entire life. During that time in the woods, I came to realize that my frustration was not with the yoga or the meditation. It was with the silence. And the problem was that the, exter the lack of, of external silence and the lack of an ability to find a distraction was really giving my inner voice a stage, and it was putting on a show. <laughs> now, you know that voice, right? The one in your head that likes every now and then to say, you're not that bright. You're a little pudgy, aren't you? You're never going to find a relationship. You're not doing that great in your career. I don't know that you ever will. You should just put your head down and hide. 
It's that voice that amplifies every fear you ever had. And that day, that's all we were talking about, were the things where my shortcomings were, the things that I had not accomplished in my life that I had hoped to, and all of the things that I worried about the most. Your inner voice knows the buttons to push. But the big problem was, is it was so silent that it had become so damn loud. There was just no way to make it stop. I couldn't turn on the television. I couldn't turn on the radio. Um, I couldn't call a friend or even have a conversation with the 23 other people who were there. Nothing. I could not get it out of my head. It was just me and my buddy, my inner voice. Now, I have to tell you, I had always thought that our inner voice uh, was our conscious talking to us. I, I come to see it differently now. I actually see our inner voice as a microphone for, for one of, of two characters that are part of us. One is our thinking mind and its buddy, the ego, and the other is our higher self. Now the challenge is the thinking mind really likes to grab the microphone and the bigger problem is is that the ego likes to control the volume. The higher self is much cooler than that. It is much smoother. It, that's not the path that it goes down. So the trouble gets to be that our thinking minds just keep thinking and adding more and 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 more into our heads until finally there's just this dis dissonant cacophony of thought in our heads and there's no space for contemplation. There's no space for rational thought and there's no space for creativity. During that walk, I came to understand that much like I was in control of the retreat, I was actually in control of this microphone. And that I needed to be able to figure out a way to manage my inner voice better. Well, it happened to be that I was at a meditation retreat. <laughs> and by the time I went back for my first meditation of the evening, I had gained a new appreciation for meditation, for its power and its purpose. I had always thought of meditation as a way just simply to evoke relaxation. But what I came to understand is it is really meant as the eraser to clean the slate that is the space of silence, to give us a chance to return to silence. Silence is our natural state. It's the space of silence that we do our best thinking. It's where our aha moments come. It's in the space of silence that we connect with our creative spirit. And it's in the space of silence that we connect with our higher self and come to understand our natural, deep, and omnipresent connection with the greater universe. Silence is so important to our existence that our bodies actually reset to silence every day through sleep. When we wake up, we are in a space of silence. The question is, is that for a few minutes or a few seconds? How will we choose to break our silence? The trouble is, many of us break the silence by reaching over for our phones on the bed stand in the morning. We check email, we check texts, we look at social media. We've not even made it out of the bed yet. Maybe we turn on the television or turn on the radio to catch the news. Before we know it, our thinking minds are going wild. All we've got in our head is Trump and Pelosi and thoughts and worries are filling up that space of silence and our minds are racing. I got to remember to go by the grocery store this evening. I've got that party. I've got to pick up, um, I've got to pick up some cheese. Oh my gosh, I've got that report. I've got to turn in this morning. Oh crap. My daughter's got that book report and I promised I'd read it before I took her to the school this morning. Did I get those books from a mom for her Christmas gift? No, I didn't. I'm so stupid. Why did I not think of that? That's why I'm not doing well at work. I can't remember things. I'm not going to get my bonus this year. You know what? There won't even be any reason to buy mom books because I'm not going to have any money. <laughs> Honoring and maintaining the space of silence can dramatically help us manage our monkey minds and help us find peace in our daily lives. A few years ago, about the time I started meditating, I um, took a great piece of advice and started waking up at the same time every morning. 
Our circadian rhythm is actually based on our wake time. It's the only thing it's based on. Not our sleep time, not the sunrise or the sunset, but whatever time we make as our wake time. No matter what, if I've had a short amount of sleep or a full long amount of sleep, I actually still wake up pretty refreshed. And I put that to having built this pattern of waking up at the same time. So with this knowledge, I started to craft my own morning ritual, a, a set of practices throughout the morning to really help me maintain that space of silence for as long as I could. And for me, frankly, I shoot to try to maintain it for about an hour. Now, the truth is, you have to adjust that to whatever your own conditions and circumstances, who else is in the house, what else you've got to do. Um, I really recommend thinking about and contemplating crafting a morning ritual. I have found it really useful in my life. Um, and to be clear, you know, we're looking for silence, but this is not just about the absence of sound, but managing what we take in and how we allow our minds to work as we get started for the day. This is all about establishing a space of silence so as to create a blank slate for which to write our days. Now for me, I get up at 5.30 every morning that gives me some time to maintain my space of silence for about an hour. Um, I shower, I head downstairs. I used to do readings every morning at that point, but I stopped doing that a few months ago because I realized they were actually activating my mind and I didn't want to do that quite yet. So I meditate for about 10 or 20 minutes. I am no advanced Zen practitioner. I just find a quiet space. I ground myself. I get my spine erect. I open my palms up, close my eyes, and I breathe. And for me, I focus on the breath as it comes in and out of my nose. Some people do focus on their bellies and the rise and the fall. It's whatever works for you. You know, the breath is not just about convenience, because, well, we all have it. Uh, but part of that focus on the breath is also because, you know, it's actually one of the few autonomic systems that we can also control. It controls itself, but we can take over. But it's also really very much one of those systems that you know, allows us to exist in these bodies, right? So it's a very deep connection to yourself and to your inner being when you do so uh, by focusing on the breath. Now, over time, my meditation practice has really become essential for me to clear a space of silence and return to that natural silent state. Um, on Sunday, for example, <clears throat> I was working on this talk, and I got a call that my dad was going to the hospital. I was in the middle of working on this talk. I had a hundred other things going on, and I knew I only had a couple of minutes. Um, it wasn't an emergency situation, but it was something I needed to get to the hospital to fairly quickly. But I still gave myself a couple of minutes, and I grounded myself, and I worked to clear my mind. Because we fill it up, and you need a little bit of space, right, for that next thing. And I needed space for my dad. And I'm glad to say Dad's doing really well right now. After meditating, I make a cup of tea, and that is when I do readings. This year I've been reading on Stoicism, and I've been reading Rumi. Um, and frankly, I choose readings that just act, start activating my mind a little bit. Um, then I start really thinking a little more deeply about what do I want? You know, like the Spice Girls, what do I really, really want? And I'm talking about those deep questions. What do I want out of life? What do I want out of this year, this month, this day? I won't, I won't lie. This is heavy stuff starting your day. And I don't spend a long time, just a couple of minutes. I added this to my practice this year because, frankly, I was coming to the realization that I was just, at times in my life, just floating along. I, I didn't know where I was headed to. I was fortunate that I had some great stop-offs on the way. And maybe it's now that I've moved into the second half of my life that I'm being more careful about my time, but I feel I want to have greater purpose and intentionality in the things that I do. So it's from these intentions that I start to put my task list together for the day. And let me be frank, my task list and I have had a very difficult relationship for many, many years. Um, it, I have allowed it to overwhelm me, and, and at times I will get to the point that I say, is that what my life has devolved to, a collection of tasks? This has helped me to frame that better. And frankly, I 
from those intentions and say, okay, what is it I want to do today? And I put that on the list before I get to the, um, wow, that's annoying, isn't it? Before I get to the, um, I'll use that as my time to have a sip. I use that before I, um, I use, I put my intentions down and what those goals are before I do the carryover from yesterday. And frankly, I find about 25% of that doesn't carry over. Uh, it's not important anymore. Or frankly, the time passed and I didn't get to it. And so let's just move on from it. Um, it's only now that I start to take a look at email um, and social media. I do a quick scan. I start to take in the news. But frankly, I only read the news. I, I don't listen to the television or radio at this time. Because frankly, I feel like I can't control. I could be brushing my hair, and all of a sudden there's a news story I really don't want to hear. For my friends from Blue Ridge Public Radio, I do, in fact, turn on BPR, but just later in the morning, uh, once I've got a little bit more control. I'm very, very choosy in the morning about what I allow to fill up my space of silence. Um, over time, this morning practice has really helped me to gain more control over my inner voice, quiet my ego and thinking mind quite a bit. But let's just be frank. 10 to 20 minutes of meditation followed with a little intentionality practice does not make a great day or a great life. You got to still keep working on it throughout the day. So there are times I just have to stop, go find myself a quiet corner, take two or three minutes, get my eraser out and try to wipe that board a little clean to make it through the rest of the day. Now, when we finally broke silence at the retreat, the 24 of us were very selective about what we shared, the words and stories we chose. Nobody blathered on simply because they'd not spoken for the past six days. In the circle, we introduced ourselves, we shared our name, where we were from, uh, what kind of work we did, a little bit about our life story, and a little bit of how we were starting to process the retreat. Now, not surprisingly... None of the real stories matched what I had put together in my head. <laughs> Old Tom from Atlanta, he was actually the professor. The professor, he was a NASCAR mechanic. <laughs> and Granny, she was in fact an Appalachian farmer in her second career. She told us that in her first career, she was a professional dancer on stage for many years, and then um, she spent time as a dancer for several years in Tech Chen Choling in Dharmasala. Now, I got to tell you, I didn't know what she was talking about until we were leaving the retreat center, and Chris said, do you know what um, Tech, Chen Choling, Tech Chen Choling is? I said, no. Well, being a Buddhist, he did. And he said, that's the court in exile of the Dalai Lama. She was a dancer for the Dalai Lama. That's amazing. And frankly, I got a little bit frustrated that I had cut off my listening and just immediately felt the need to label and, and write a narrative for everybody. I needed to have listened more that week, even if it wasn't for words, to understand who I was with. I don't know that I would still would have guessed that's what she had done in life, <clears throat> but I might have given a little more space. In the weeks and months that followed, the profundity of this experience uh, really began to reveal itself to me. <clears throat> After I got home, I continued to be very, very deliberate about the conversations I had and the words I chose. It's a bit like eating again after a fast or after you've had a stomach bug. You don't just go get the spiciest bowl of dal or the juiciest steak and start digging in. you got to take it in slowly and sort of reacclimate your system. Uh, the other thing I found is that I was really getting turned off by banal conversation. You know, conversations about nothing important or um, nothing in particular, sort of a living Seinfeld episode. We all have those. I know we do. Um, I was coming to see silence as too precious to waste. I came, and I still do, crave silence. Um, I stopped leaving the television on for background noise to my life in the house and stopped turning the radio on every time I got in the car. I actually still do that today. I only turn the television and the radio on 
when I have intention and purpose, there's something that I want to see. Um, I also came to be much more comfortable about being in silence with people and in community. Uh, despite having been so uncomfortable with, those di- with the dining experience at the retreat and, and maybe even breakfast at Creative Mornings this morning. It's funny that as much of an extrovert as I am, all of my closest, dearest, and best friends are deeply introverted people. At times, we seem like a real mismatch. Uh, one of my friends said, you know, actually, you're an introvert's extrovert. I was like, what do you, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you, you actually listen. Now, I'll tell you, that was not my natural sensibility. That was a hard-learned skill over the years. But today, my friends and I, we find that space of silence to be some of the most healing space for ourselves. That when one of us calls the other to talk about a real difficult challenge in our lives, we just hold space for each other. We don't immediately start trying to use our voice to tell solutions and craft ideas for how to get through this. One friend and I, we can sit on the phone for 10 or 15 minutes, not saying a word, just simply breathing loud enough that we can hear each other and know we're there for each other. Verbal support and solutions can come later. Maybe that day, maybe that week, maybe that month. Just being present through silence is very, very powerful medicine. Now, at work, I started to talk less in meetings. I'll be honest, this is still a challenge for me. Um, But I found that when I started speaking less, I could listen more. I started to realize the extraordinary power of silence in conversation. I always knew the power of words, but I hadn't realized how powerful silence itself could be, sometimes even more powerful than the words. Uh, You know, a wise person once said, nothing. (laughs) Often isn't the most influential person in the meeting the one who says the least? The one who, when they actually contribute, were very thoughtful about that contribution to the point that when they do speak, everybody turns and says, oh, we should pay attention. Uh, You know, silence, in fact, is a master negotiator's most powerful tool. Would you believe that in a recent study, Americans said that they believe there should only be three seconds of silence between spoken sentences between two people? Three seconds. That's not enough time to even understand what the person just said to you. That's more about what we're getting ready to say. How many times have you been going to introduce yourself and you think about your introduction? People introduce themselves and you got no idea who they are because you were focused on doing that yourself. It gets to the point that people can't stand that space of silence in a conversation so much that they start saying things that they probably not ought to say. Well, you know, I only paid one hundred fifty thousand dollars for this house, so I guess I could let it go for one hundred and eighty instead of two hundred. Uh, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but I told our boss what Juliet told us at lunch yesterday. Well, Mr. Bond, this is exactly how I plan to take over the world. <laughs> my no, no, my no, dumb moment was: if I speak less, I can hear more. It's only in the space of, deep, of silence that deep listening can occur. Uh, you can't listen if you're talking. Uh, none of this is to say don't talk, but rather just be thoughtful and intentional when you break your silence. Breaking silence is a choice. I have been very careful and selective about breaking silence this morning in the things that I've shared with you. Um, I've shared stories that I've never told in public. I also know that this talk is being videotaped and will be posted on the web for who knows how long. So there are things that I have chosen not to talk about this morning. There are frankly things that I could share that I would love to share with the group, but I could, they're so tender to my heart that I couldn't tell them to be up on the web for the rest of my life. I'm exercising what poet Adrian Rich called verbal privilege. Verbal privilege, like any other privilege, is influenced by race and gender, socioeconomics, and especially geography. For most, verbal privilege still has great limitations. Um, Because of who I am and the work I do, and I've got a presence in the public eye, there are things that I just don't feel I can speak about publicly. 
Uh, breaking silence is a choice, but it has many consequences. Let's be clear. There are hundreds of millions of people who have no verbal privilege. They are forced into silence. Them breaking silence has very severe consequences. The Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh broke his silence and gave a speech at Cornell in the 1960s about peace in his native Vietnam. And for 39 years. Anita Hill broke her silence about sexual, being sexually assaulted by a Supreme Court nominee and faced national ridicule and castigation. <coughs> Matthew Shepard broke his silence about who he was to two guys in a bar. They tortured and beat him to death. And his mother, Judy, she broke her silence and was willing to share the story of the loss of her child and has saved countless young men just like Matthew. When Tarana Burke broke silence and said, me too, and the prevalence of sexual assault in our culture began to be seen. And when Dr. King stood at a pulpit in a church in Atlanta and broke the silence for millions of African Americans, he began a revolution. Silence allows us to tap deeply into the universe. And while tapping deeply into the universe is transformative, it is a scary and messy, messy thing. Silence reveals the interconnectedness of all things, which is wonderful and damn uncomfortable at the same time. Silence connects us to all that is great and all that is terrible. Silence is our natural state. It elevates our individuality as well as our community. But with that comes a great deal of responsibility to each other. Silence is not a nothingness to be feared, nor should it be taken for granted. It's a tool. It's a blank slate upon which our creative spirit works, upon which our thinking mind finds those aha moments, and in which our, human self, our higher self connects us to the universe. Now, whether or not you're comfortable or uncomfortable with silence, I encourage you to welcome it into your life. Let it be a constant companion along your path. Let it help you to do the work you're here to do, and let it help you find peace. When you break your silence, let it be intentional. Let it be with purpose. You are a powerful, powerful creator. Be deliberate in your voice and in your actions, and the rewards will be great for many. Thank you for letting me share with you today.